So as of late, I've been bringing you guys a lot of different individuals who I serve time with in prison. And today is no exception to that because I'm sitting here with a young guy that I know from serving time, a young guy nicknamed Pee Wee, who I've spoken a little bit about on live streams, but only briefly. This is a young guy that I definitely want to bring the story to after prison show of because what this guy has gone through and also what he's going through right now is crazy. This is probably one of the most live wire individuals that I ever served time with. And when you hear his story, I mean, it's going to completely illustrate that. Now, again, while locked up, your nickname was Pee Wee, but of course, that's not your real name. My name is David Belch. And how old are you? 24 years old, born August 4th, 1993. And, you know, while we served time together, we were at the last prison that I was at, uh, Indian Creek. This would not be the last prison that you would go to, and we're going to get into more about that in this video. But while at this prison, I mean, you were a live wire. You fought a lot. You were involved in gangs. And, I mean, you were really doing some hard time. Would you talk to me a little bit about what serving time for you was actually like? Serving time for me was the biggest mistake of my life, honestly. From the time I was 17, I spent almost seven years of my life wasted, doing stupid stuff, making bad decisions. And that's the biggest thing I've always had, making poor decision-making skills. I regret everything I've ever done, every crime I've ever committed, I wish I could take it back. Now, will you tell me what you originally got locked up for that would end up sending you to prison? As an adult, when I turned 18, August 4th, 2011, I was in Tidewater Detention Home. I was serving a seven months, six, seven months and 16 day sentence for breaking and entering as a juvenile. I was in the post dispositional program at Tidewater Detention Home, 420 Albemarle Drive. Got out four months later, excuse me, seven months later, November 7th of 2011. Got out four months, March 5th, 2012. I got locked right back up as an adult. And what was that for? breaking enterings, grand larcenies, possession of stolen property, and obtaining money under false pretenses. I had 11 charges. They dropped three misdemeanors and smoked me with eight felonies. John William Brown sentenced me, and John William Brown was my father's lawyer before he was ever my judge. He told me when I went in the courtroom, he said, I know your family, I know your father. Yes, and I know you very well. He said, your father has given over 30 years to the system. And he said, I'm looking at your juvenile record, and it seems like me like you can't get yourself right. I said, Your Honor, that's not the case. I said, I just make poor decision-making skills, and that's always been my biggest problem. And how much time did he sentence you to? Four years and 24 months. I was in jail 10 and a half months before I got sentenced. And when I finally got sentenced, he gave me a year time served on that 10 and a half months, along with another year in Chesapeake City Jail then the four-year youthful offender program at Indian Creek Correctional Center. Now, when I met you for the first time, it was at Indian Creek, and like you said, you were in there for the youthful offender program, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't complete this successfully, would you? No, I didn't. So we had to stop the interview for just a minute because you've been dealing with a lot of stuff, and you had to make a phone call, and I know you just got so much crazy stuff going on right now. Um, so we're going to have to go a little back and forth with all of this. Again, I cannot emphasize enough just how much of a, a live wire, a loose cannon you are. And I'm not saying that like anything crazy. I mean, it's the absolute truth. You mentioned earlier how you make a lot of bad decisions. And in fact, just recently, like a couple of days ago, you've made some bad decisions and you're dealing with that right now. Would you like to talk about any of that? I'm tired of keeping it boggled up. I want my life back. I want my family back and I want my best friends back that I over. I'm willing to do anything that I can to fix it. I just found out that I just caused $3,800 worth of damage to her van. Now you're talking about uh, some girl who you were living with, uh, her vehicle. What happened with this vehicle? I went mud in a minivan and I went to Walmart. You took the minivan? I, I drank two beers, I drank two Bud Light Platinum 6.0s. 
I drank a Mad Dog 2020 that I bought from Walmart, and I drank a bottle of Wild Hours Rose. So you drank quite a bit, and you were pretty drunk, and then you decided to take this girl's vehicle, this minivan, and go cruising in this thing. Yeah, but I didn't drink till I, I didn't drink the bottle of Wild Hours Rose till I got home. Now, with the fact that you said earlier how you constantly make mistakes, you make bad judgment calls, what was your line of thinking for doing this? Did you just, were you bored? Did you that's just... my thing. I wasn't thinking, and that's my problem that I've always had. I don't think before I do shit. I'm just so worried about the moment and living for the moment at that time. I don't worry about the responsibility that I have to take till the next day or the next hour. Who was this girl that you were living with whose van that you took? It's my best friend. That's all I can say right now. Both of my best friends that I f***ed over. And this was somebody who gave you a chance and was letting you live with them, correct? Somebody who gave me a place to stay because I didn't have nowhere to go. And if I didn't have nowhere to go, I would be facing 26 years right now. And they're the only reason I'm out right now. And that all I can do is sit here and cry like a little girl. I'm not going to sit here and say you're crying like a little girl, but you know, you know you've made mistakes. You're upset about the fact that you know, your actions are causing pain and suffering to somebody else. You do make a lot of really crazy decisions, and it's after the fact, it's unfortunate, but it is after the fact that you realize you know, you've done something wrong. That's the thing, I don't realize what I did wrong until after I do it. I'm tired of making that decision, I'm tired of, and I'm tired of being a, a, a mess up. I'm tired of screwing up. I'm tired of the life that I'm living. I should have learned the first time that I stole something when I had a gun stuck to my head. I'll never forget it. It was June 24th, 2008. I broke into a dude's gazebo named Danny. He had a licensed bar. I broke in there a couple times before, but this time I went in the wrong door, which had a silent alarm and a hidden camera on it. I was in there for five minutes. Next thing I know, he comes out. Him and his wife, he had a Louisville Slugger on one shoulder and a 40 caliber Kimber with a laser pointed at my chest. He said, if you can move, I'm gonna shoot you. You know, you say you've gotten yourself into situations that you wish you would have never gotten yourself into. Well, again, you're 25 years old. You went to prison when you were- 18. 18 years old and it wasn't long before you got wrapped up in gang activity, correct? Yep. Talk to me a little bit about uh, you getting involved with a gang for the first time in prison. The first time I was ever involved in an organization was in Chesapeake City Jail. I became a 974 gangster disciple. I went out on a limb for people that I mess with and when it comes to find out, when I was in the jail, everything seemed right with them and they were moving the right way that they were supposed to. But when I got up the road, when I finally hit the first spread that I hit, which was in the Creek Correctional Center, you try to get yourself right and you try to do everything you can to represent who you are and what you represent. I messed that up. I tried to get myself right. The people that I went to didn't want to accept me, didn't told me I am, I'm not, I'm not nothing. And I told him, if I'm not nothing, y'all gonna beat me out of it. Nobody ever put their hands on me. I went my separate ways with them. I got into an organization that I realized that they're not who they are. I joined a gang called DMI, Dead Man Incorporated. They're not who they say they are. They're not legit. They're never gonna be legit because of the people that they are. It's messed up. They don't live under the oath that they take, and they don't live the life that they're supposed to live. Now, real quick, let me stop you right here, because let's talk about the Dead Man Inc. Uh, that you were a part of. While you were a part of this gang, and this is actually the second gang that you would join while being locked up, you were putting in some work with this, uh, with this organization, correct? I was the only person putting in work for that organization. I mean, you were fighting, and you were fighting a lot. I fought 14 different times in the last six years of my life that I was incarcerated. 
I, I went out on a limb for people that didn't want to go out on a limb for me. Somebody who called me their brother, maybe not by blood, but by, by the oath that we took. And I realized that who I am is not meant for them and they're not meant for me. And you would soon after not be able to complete the youth offender program, probably a part of that being because you were in the gang, because you were fighting so much, you would end up getting shipped off of Indian Creek, going to what, a level four, a level five? Level four, five maximum security penitentiary that houses death row inmates. I never thought I'd see that day in my life and I never thought I'd see somebody get stabbed to death seven times in the neck. And you saw that while there? There was a Mexican dude and a black dude. Somebody tried to extort a white dude because they owed the Serenio's money. And the Serenio wasn't going for it. And he said, I respect white people because they're more loyal than anybody has ever been to us. He said, they show love to us that anybody has ever done. And he said, I'm not gonna let nobody take advantage of them. I, f I mess with white people. And I do what I can for them because they're loyal. He stabbed dude in the neck seven times. I, wanted, I was in the pod 2C when it happened. And what was that like to see that? It sucks, honestly, because it, it changes your whole perspective. It changes your whole perspective of life. When you see somebody get stabbed in the neck seven times with probably about a 10 inch ice pick and they bleed out right there in front of you, their blood almost hitting your shoes and you have to lay on the floor right next to that watching them bleed out holding their neck, that shit messes you up. It changes your whole mindset. It changes your whole perspective of the way you look at stuff. I never thought I'd see that a day in my life and I didn't want to see that and I regret ever getting locked up because I am a good person. May, a lot of people may not see that because of who I am, what I represent, the tattoos that I got on my body, the life that I'm living. But I want people to know that and I want people to understand and respect me for who I am and what I try to be. I try to be a decent individual who's trying to get himself right but at the same time needs help and is admitting that they need help because I'm not gonna hide it. I have nothing to hide from nobody. I'm never gonna hide nothing from nobody. What do you think your biggest problem is that you need help with? Is it uh, counseling, some kind of uh, medication possibly? Do you feel like you've got uh, issues psychologically? I don't think that I have any issues psychologically. I went for a mental health evaluation at Behavioral Services Board in, Ch in P Portsmouth. My father has gone through his whole life being a messed up individual. I grew up being beat, I grew up being abused, being neglected. My grandmother and my grandfather adopted me and my brother when we were one and two years old. My mom left 1994, September the 6th, the day after Labor Day. My grandparents adopted me and my brother till the time we were 18, took care of us, showed us love, grew up in a family that I was supposed to grow up in. My brother means everything to me. My family will always mean everything to me. So it sounds like you do have or you have had family support. Do you still have that now or have people given up on you? I do have family support, but at the same time I do have family that I believe looks at me as an outcast. I've had my Uncle Jimmy Belch tell me when my grandfather died June 14th of 2011 that I'm the reason for my grandfather's death. Me and my brother are the reason for my grandfather's death because we put so much stress on him, it, it hurt him and, it, and it, it made his heart explode. I want to get back to the gang, the gang life for a minute. Will you talk to me a little bit about why you wanted to join a gang, why you did join a gang? Because a lot of people get the perception that while locked up, you join a gang because you're looking for protection, you're looking for acceptance, something to belong to. What was your reason for joining? My reason for joining an organization was not because of protection. I don't need nobody to fend for myself. I learned how to fend for myself over the last four years before I got to Sussex One State Prison. And I didn't, I was there at Sussex One State Prison from April 15th of 2016 till December the 15th of 2017. I spent 20 months exactly on Sussex One State Prison. And I realized that the organization that I got into was off the strength of that I that I mess with somebody so much and I realize that they're gonna be there for me and not like everybody says that they are and then when it comes down to it, 
they don't show you no love, they're not gonna be there for you. I've had people willing to fight for me. And when I realize people are there for me like a side family, I understand that I don't need acceptance. I don't care what other people think about me and I don't care how other people see me in my perspective. Let's talk a little bit about recently what's been going on with you. You know, we just ran into you probably about three weeks ago at a probation office where you were in the probation office and not knowing if you were gonna be getting violated right there because you had just come home from prison in December. And, and when, you were, when you came home from prison, you were living in a halfway house and talk to me a little bit about what was going on with you in the halfway house and, and what that was like. The halfway house that I went to, I thought it was what it was supposed to be when I signed up for it, but it wasn't. The people that are there, child, there's 16 people in the house. At least eight or nine of them have messed up charges. I didn't intend to be around that and I don't condone none of that. I, re I feel like everybody that does stuff like that should be locked up for the rest of their life. Yeah, of course. And when you were living in this halfway house, you had violated the terms of the halfway house three times, twice by sneaking out at night, uh, and one time by cashing your check when you weren't supposed to cash your check, and you were working. As a matter of fact, when we saw you in that probation office, you had your work hoodie on, you were working, uh, doing a landscaping job, if I can remember correctly. Landscaping services of Hampton Roads, my boss was Mark. I cashed my check when I wasn't supposed to. Everything that I make was supposed to go to the halfway house. And if I want to withdraw money, I got to put in a request on the Monday and I get my money on that Friday when I get my check. How much did you have to pay to live in the halfway house? $95 a week. Now, the final straw for the halfway house was you had snuck out one night. Uh, and talk to me a little bit about what you went through because this was crazy. Tell me what you did in an effort to try to not get caught when you snuck out this night to go see your girlfriend. I put a dummy in a bed. I had a little hat. I stuffed a, I stuffed a shirt in it to make it look like it was my head. I used a pillow for my body and I, lo I used two hoodies for my legs and I put a pair of boots in there to make it look like it was my feet. Covered it up with a blanket, told everybody in the room there was three other people in the room. Kevin, Jerome, and Michael. I told them to keep this light off no matter what. Don't cut it on. I will be back in the morning by six o'clock. Don't cut this light on. If they ask me why I went to bed so early, just tell them I didn't feel good, I was having a family emergency. I covered up the bed with the dummy, I snuck out, I went and had some fun. You got a text message from the halfway house saying, when you come back, pack your, pack your, pack your stuff up. Pack your stuff up. Again, when we ran into you at that probation office, you didn't know if you were going to get violated and go back to jail. And what actually ended up happening? Did they violate you, send you back to jail? They talk, started talking to me. They asked me, did I have anywhere to go? My probation officer said she's not going to violate me because she don't, want me to, she don't want me to go back to prison. But at the same time, she said it's not in her hands no more. It's the deputy chief decision. The lady asked me, did I have anywhere to go? I said, I called my uncle in Chesapeake. He said, I can't take you. He said, I got five people at the house right now. I called my father and I called my stepmother in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. I couldn't go there because I didn't have an interstate compact. They said, well, we're going to send you to the Union Mission. We're going to give you two bus passes, one for the night to go to the Union Mission. It was free all day, all night bus pass. Then they gave me one for that following morning. Next thing I know, I'm sitting in the office. They said, go sit in here real quick, talk to him. They said, we got to get all your paperwork straight and that way we can get you out of the office. Next thing I know, I'm sitting there talking to a dude, opening up to him, letting him know what's been going on, the decisions that I've been making, why I've been acting the way I have. And I see four cops, four Chesapeake police officers come in. All of them had their tasers drawn, said, Mr. Bush, you need to stand up, put your hands behind your back. So they ended up locking you up. They pretty much lied to you saying, hey, we're going to do this, but they locked you up. And what did they lock you up for? Was it a violation or because you had nowhere to go? They locked me up because it was a violation of post-release parole. So when you got locked up, this time, how long had you been home from prison at that point? Not even two months, not even 40 days. And you get locked up because of this violation of post-release uh, conditions. And how long do you stay locked up? I got out December the 15th of 2017, got reincarcerated in Jan on January 22nd, 2018. I was locked up from January 22nd to, I believe, February 11th or 12th. The probation, the, the parole board came and seen me and said, Mr. Belch, we would be doing your parole. 
hearing on February 1st, 2018. She said, why did you get kicked out of the halfway house? I told her that I cashed my check when I wasn't supposed to. I told her that I snuck out of the house. She asked me why I snuck out of the house. I told her that I wanted to go see my brother in Suffolk, o Sentara Obesity Hospital in Suffolk because my brother was di just diagnosed with COPD disorder. I told her I went out and stayed at the hospital with him because I needed him and he wanted me to be there because nobody could come because all my family was in Carolina. Somebody told him that I was bullying somebody at the house because I was a gang member. He was scared of me and didn't want me to stay at the house. And with all of this, you would end up getting released again. She said, do you have anywhere to go? I said, I can honestly ask somebody. She said, well, we're going to need to know right now. She asked my probation officer, does he have any charges pending? She said, no, ma'am, he does not. My probation officer said, I'm not going to violate him. She said, are you going to violate him? She said, I have to document this. She said, I'm not going to violate him. I told Mr. Belch I'm not going to violate him. I just want what's best for him. I'm wanting to do the right thing. She said, well, Mr. Belch, she said, I'm going to make the decision for you right now. She said, if you have somewhere to go, she said, you will, you will be released. She said, but you don't have nowhere to go. You're going to be staying locked up. And you would end up finding somewhere to go through a good friend of yours. A good friend of mine, they gave me a place to stay. They, they allowed me to come into their house, and I messed that up. I stayed there for a few weeks. I did what I had to do, I helped them out. Well, you were only released a couple of days ago, correct? And while living with this person, what day was it when you took their van and ended up going, riding around in this van? Tuesday night, they went off to see their mother. She went off to see her mother because her mom just found out she had some upsetting news. And they asked me, was I able to stay here by myself? Was I able to? was able to do everything I had to do. I said, yes. I realized she left the keys at the house for her van, her best friend. And I said, I told her that I'm sitting at the house. She said, why do you have Wi-Fi? I said, because I'm at Walmart. She said, why are you at Walmart? I said, because I walked. I didn't walk, I drove the van. And I went mudding in the field with a minivan that I never thought would happen. I never thought I was gonna make it through the field. I got it stuck for about five or 10 minutes buried the tires probably about six to eight inches deep. Finally got out, I thought I was gonna pretty much have to call a tow truck when I didn't have no money. But I finally got the van out by the grace of God. And I guess I messed the frame up doing what I did. The tire went sideways, I turned the wheel as much as I could left and right to try to get it out. I did what I had to get, do to get that van out. I revved the engine up as, to the, pretty much all the RPMs and I don't know what happened. I, I didn't, wreck, I didn't wreck it. But the van is pretty much totaled at this point. The van is, it's, I don't believe it's totaled. But it's got a substantial amount of damage. It's got a substantial amount of damage, which has cost $3,800, which I promised my best friend that I would pay back every penny of it. Let me ask you a question. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this as we wrap this up because we, we do have to wrap this up. I do hope we are able to do a follow-up with you and find out what happens moving forward from here. But it would seem like, as you mentioned in the beginning of this, you know, you have poor decision-making skills and you have made a lot of mistakes in your life. And even just a couple of days ago, you've made some pretty crazy decisions in your life. Um, and you know, if we could get deeper into your story, we could really showcase some of the crazy stuff that you've done. I mean, you are really a guy who has a pretty, pretty good reputation for being pretty wild. But we're not gonna get any further into that. The final thing that I wanna talk with you about as, again, we wrap this up is, you know, if you had a message that you would say to any young people who might be watching this, who could potentially be going down the same path that you've been down, that you've gone down, that you are still going down right now, you know, what would your message be to anybody out there who probably has the same type of issues making bad decisions? Learn how to make the right ones, no matter what the outcome is going to be. Life is only guaranteed one time. You don't have a second chance. Do what you got to do to stay straight and keep your mind focused on the things that you want to do. Have goals, set plans, and do what you got to do to make it and prosper through your life. Understand that life is not guaranteed. The next day is never guaranteed, never going to be guaranteed. It's a blessing to wake up every day knowing that you have another breath to take, another, another meal to eat, another shower to take, and people who love you. Don't mess up. Don't do stupid stuff. Don't follow down the path that I've gone through. Realize that if you got people there who love you, 
don't screw them over because it's going, going to come back to bite you. Karma is everything, and I do believe in karma. What goes around comes around. And finally, you know, from here right now, Pee Wee, tell me what your plan is. What are you going to do from this moment right here in an effort to try to do something better than what's been going on in your life thus far? Since the day that I woke up, I realized everything plays a toll on me over the last couple of days at what I've done to mess my friendship up with these people. Luckily, they're forgiving and they have a heart for me because they don't want to see me get in trouble and they don't want to see me do the wrong thing. I've thought about checking myself into rehab, getting help, and doing what I got to do to get my life straight. Medication, I don't care what it is, I'm tired of making stupid decisions and I'm tired of living a criminal's lifestyle. I want to be a prospering individual who does what they got to do, who has goals, who has a family one day, who has his car, who has his license, and who has his own house. Somebody that can say, I want to be like him. I don't want to be another outcast, and I don't want to be another statistic, because that's not what I am. I'm not going to be another statistic to anybody. I was incarcerated four different times, 2008, 2011, 2012, and 2018. There's a possibility that I can be facing going back right now, and I don't want that to happen. I want to apologize for everything I've ever done, for all the decisions making that, that has come out negative. And I want my friends to know that I'm sorry for everything I've done. I sit here and cry at night because I know that I messed up something good that I had when y'all gave me a roof over my head, showers to take, meals to eat. Words can't explain the way I feel right now. I'm sorry and I just want y'all to know that and I appreciate everything I've done for me.